Can we begin with your saying your name? My name is Judy Trin. And where were you born? I was born in uh, Saigon or Ho Chi Minh City, December 11th, 1974. And um, can you tell me about your family makeup? In, uh, in uh, Vietnam, my family makeup is uh, I have a mother and a father and a younger sister who is two years younger than me. But we live sort of in an extended family home that belonged to my grandfather. So from my memory of it as a child, it was sort of a, um, a square home with a central courtyard. And my grandfather and grandmother uh, lived in the, uh, the biggest wing where we would always meet for family dinners. But then I remember uh, we also lived with um, uh, other aunts and uncles, and they lived in other parts of the house. And what did your parents do for a living? My mother was a, uh, she graduated from college with an accounting degree, and she worked as an accountant. And then she was also a part-time uh, journalist for a, uh, a local Chinese newspaper. My father worked at a textile plant. And he was in charge of um, the dye patterns. So uh, basically uh, putting patterns uh, made from dye onto uh, textiles that uh, they would ship and export. And what memories do you have of the years immediately after the fall of Saigon? I don't have uh, many memories. I have... Uh, a memory of uh, fleeing while we were on the boat, and I have one memory of the refugee camp. My memory on the boat is uh, we were, uh, when, after we left Vietnam, uh, we were boarded by pirates twice. Um, so the first group of pirates came, uh, and they had uh, stolen everything. They had a, a gun, they had machetes, and there was probably a group of 10 of them. And I remember being very, very hungry and I was four years old at the time. And my mother was just trying to get me to, to be quiet because she didn't want to draw attention. So, but I, but I was hungry and I wanted to eat something. And I remember her shifting, she says, she's, uh, she's shifting on the boat and she realizes that she's sitting on um, a piece of bread. It's a, um, a taro root bun and it's flattened, and it might have been moldy. She had it for a few days, but uh, it was enough that she just took it, ripped a piece of it, and then just shoved it in my mouth so I would stop crying from hunger. How old were you at the time? I was four. And then my second memory of um, fleeing Vietnam would have been when we were uh, in the refugee camp. And once again, it's related to food. I was crawling on the ground, there are um, the floor. It was very hot uh, in the tents because the refugee camp was right on a was close to a beach. And I remember they we slept on these wooden boards, and uh, so you could see um, you could see uh, cracks in the wooden boards or slats through the wooden boards. I was crawling. I was looking for food, and I thought what I saw was a piece of candy. It was kind of a uh, reddish bronze. So then I used my little fingers and then I put my fingers to the crack and I grabbed it and I grabbed it and I put it in my mouth and my mother uh, said no. She just started screaming <laughs> once again and I remember she just came over, she grabbed open my mouth, she forced my mouth open, put her fingers in and took out uh, what was in there and it was, it was a penny. I thought it was a piece of candy but it was a penny. So those are my two memories. So can we go back and um, I guess you'll have to rely on you on accounts mm -hmm. that your parents have passed to That's right. you. Um, what do you know about their lives in you know between 1975 and the time that you left? I know that uh, we were the last members of the extended family to leave. Um, my grandparents had gone. Uh, my father's uh, siblings had all left. Uh, and the reason why we remained was because my sister was born premature and she was very ill. So my mother did not feel like she could travel with my sister. So we kept on delaying and delaying until one day we couldn't delay anymore. My father had a, um, 
had served for a time with the South Vietnamese military. Um, he was not on the front lines, but that he had actually uh, trained for it. But because he also had what was considered a professional degree, they didn't send him to the front lines. But because he had military training, he was told that uh, he would be put into a re-education camp and uh, sent to the countryside. So uh, when he got notice, uh, it was, he knew that he was targeted. They had to leave immediately. So at that time, my sister would have been uh, about 20 months old. Um, she was very severely underweight, and, uh, but there was no choice. My, my family made the decision to flee at that time. When the bus was this? This would have been uh, around 1978. And where did you go? So we we were lucky in the sense that um, we had we were a family of means. Um, uh, we had uh, we were able to liquidate our assets. I remember a story my mother and father telling me um, that basically we had just um, we fled with just some small parcels, but we had the equivalent of um, 30 uh, pieces of gold, and they were pieces of gold that uh, were in the shape of um, a, a credit card. So it was one ounce pieces of gold in the shape of a credit card. And so we had, uh, we had 30 pieces of that, and the idea was that we would use that, those pieces to bribe officials to let us out of uh, the country. And then we also had $75 US, and we had a letter from my aunt uh, who was in Canada. So, you know, in, in the case that we would have any Canadian officials who, who could help us, uh, that, was, that was our one foreign contact. So we left. Um, there was a very long bus ride. And so I do remember once again that there, there was a moment on that bus ride in which it's just a cramped bus and my father had to leave the bus and he left for several hours and I'm not I wasn't sure why but the reason why was because we were going through checkpoints and because of my father's military background my mother was very concerned that he would be turned around or he would be taken into custody uh, by the North Vietnamese so he basically had gotten off the bus and he was just walking through the checkpoints, going through uh, the, the forest, the back roads, in hopes of meeting us later on after we passed the checkpoint. So he disappeared for several hours, but he came back on the bus. Um, so we went to a fishing village. And uh, so the fishing village was called Rakia. And at that fishing village, we had to uh, wait for uh, the fishing boat to come in that would take us to Malaysia. Uh, but from what I understand from my mother is that uh, the, the boat decided not to head all the way to Rakia. Instead, we had to get on another smaller boat to take us to another island, um, an island called Khan. And there, a larger fishing vessel would meet us to take us to Malaysia. Give me a second. So Rakia, is that Ratya? Yes. R A C H. Yes. Ratya. And so Gong is really a, a, a in Vietnam territory. Yes. It might be Gong Dao. It might be. Okay. And um, where did you stay in Ratya? So I'm not. I don't know if this was in Rakia or if it was in Khon, but. Uh, we, we obviously didn't have a home, but we had money, so we paid, uh, we paid uh, residents who lived there to allow us to sleep on their porch. So basically, um, that, was, that was our home. <laughs> a small area on a porch where we would just sleep at night to have some shelter from the rain and the sun. Uh, but there was nothing to do. My parents said it was it was the most boring time of their lives because they just kept on waiting and waiting and waiting for this fishing vessel. And uh, uh, several fishing vessels came, but they weren't able to get on, so they had to wait and wait again until they could actually get on one that wasn't full or one that they could actually get on that was willing to take extra people. And toward the end, 
most of the fishing vessels were, were over at capacity. At the time, there were two types of vessels leaving Vietnam, one which was half sanctioned, officially sanctioned, mm -hmm. um, more for people of uh, uh, Chinese descent. Mm -hmm. You know, so you had to like bribe the... Yes. Uh, was, was that one of Yes, my parents are of Chinese descent. Okay. Um, they, and I, I don't know for sure, but I do know they bribed uh, officials to get on, so that that might make uh, that might align with uh, what happened there. Uh, they you were living on uh, someone's porch in Rat Yeah. Right. Why were you not afraid of being reported? My understanding is that we left for Rat Yeah because that's where we were going to find fishermen who were going to take us on their boats to Malaysia. Uh, but we had to find uh, a fisherman who was willing, and we had to pay them. So what we did was that we paid someone to stay on their porch. And then at the same time, my parents would look for a fishing captain. And the fishing captain that we found um, was also planning to flee. So he was going to take his boat, his family, as well as however many people who were willing to pay him to Malaysia. So how long were you there? I believe my parents said we were there for several months, I think between three and five months. Um, I, I mentioned also that we, we went to another island, uh, so I'm not quite sure the, how long we were in Rakia versus how long we were in the island of, of Khan. So uh, that's something that my mother may have to answer. And... Um, and um, do you, remember, do you remember anything about how you spent your time during that period, how you spent your day? No, I have no memory of that fishing village. I have a memory of the boat. I have a memory of the pirates. I have a memory of, I have one memory about living in Saigon. And I have uh, a memory of the refugee camp. So it's, it's interesting to me too, because there are lots of blank spaces in my memory that haven't been unlocked or that I just have not been able to, uh, to uh, retrieve. And um, when did you, did you make the voyage to Malaysia? We would have uh, made the voyage to Malaysia in the spring of 1979, around March uh, 22nd, I believe. From what your parents told you, mm -hmm. what, what was um, the trip like? It was a five-day journey. The fishing vessel we were on was the size of a yellow school bus, so maybe a meter longer and perhaps another half meter wider than a yellow school bus. Uh, but they were able to fit 315 people on that boat. My mother describes it as um, being so cramped that if you turned your head, you would bump noses with the person next to you. Um, on that boat, my sister was very sick, but there were also other children who were uh, near death. And she remembers during that journey hearing a mother's cry in the middle of the night. And she said it was the most horrific cry uh, it was just piercing and it couldn't be stopped and she knew that her child had died and, and she kept on looking at my my sister wondering if my sister was next because my sister had uh, severe dysentery and so she was suffering from uh, uh, diarrhea she was vomiting and she was extremely dehydrated and there happened to be a doctor next to my uh, my father on that boat and he he basically had told my parents to prepare for your daughter's death. Were there other adversities that they talked about? There, while we were there, so it was a five-day journey. On day three, we were boarded by pirates. Um, my parents tell me that it was a group of about ten pirates. They were armed with um, guns and machetes, 
and they came on board and they basically wanted everyone's valuables. So um, my parents had uh, fled with their pieces of gold with some jewelry and their US dollars. So that was all taken. And uh, uh, basically they had ransacked the entire boat and then they left. But they did not, um, they did not hurt any of the people on the boat from what my parents have told me. So we are one of the luckier ones. But then on day four, we were boarded by pirates again. And uh, this time the pirates were angry because there was nothing left for them to take. So they took our food rations. They took the remaining water. They took the remaining rice that was on board. Um, and, and then they left. So we knew that our ability to survive on that boat um, was very limited. And then we arrived on day five, we saw land in the distance, and uh, that was Malaysia. My dad describes it as uh, every, everyone letting out a cheer when, when they could see the land on the horizon. But that hope would immediately turn into uh, frustration and despair because we were intercepted by the Malaysian Navy. And the Malaysian Navy basically said that we could not dock there because the refugee camp was full. And they towed us back out to international waters. They said to the captain that he had to, that he needed to go to Cambodia or Thailand. And they pulled him out to international waters. But the, the fishing captain doesn't know how to get to Thailand, doesn't know how to get to Cambodia. so. He made the decision that under the cover of darkness, he was going to turn the boat around. We had no more food or water on board, and we weren't going to be able to make that journey. So he said, we're going to turn our boat around, and when we get close enough to shore, we are going to sink the boat, and everyone will have to swim to shore. So that night, they turned around, and as they neared land, um, my, uh, my parents, I said, it's probably about three to 400 meters away from land, as close as they could get without being detected. And, and so what they did was the, uh, the men on board the, uh, the boat took, ax took axes or heavy equipment of any sort, and they just started um, slamming the engine. They also set fire to the engine. And the idea was that if the boat was going to sink, there was no way that it would be turned around. We would have to be accepted into that refugee camp. So people were jumping overboard to swim to shore or hoping uh, to float ashore. And they were grabbing whatever pieces of wood, tearing apart the boat that they could use as a flotation device. My mother tells a story that um, my dad uh, jumps overboard first, and then she's with me, holding. she's holding on to my sister, and I am four, and she's telling me to jump, but I'm scared, you know? My dad's uh, down in the water, and he's calling for me to jump, to jump, uh, but I don't know how to swim. So my mother puts down my sister, basically grabs me, and throws me overboard and hopes that my dad will find me. And then she grabs my sister and she jumps overboard with my sister. So, but we made it, we made it to shore. I did not know this until um, just a few years ago, but when we first arrived in Canada, my mother used to have nightmares every night, recurring nightmares of that scene of tossing me overboard. And she lived with the guilt that one day I would remember that and resent her. But I didn't remember that, and she never told me. Not until I was, not until I was 40. So. And so what happened next? We get to shore, um, and they, uh, they find us, actually, about a day or two later and they take us to the refugee camp. But there's a really interesting story in that. Um, I mentioned that my sister was suffering from uh, severe dysentery. So 
she, well, her condition wasn't getting any better. And my mother is pacing along the beachfront. Um, and she's praying. She's like, uh, you know, help me to accept the fact that my daughter is going to die. You know, if any way, you know, like, please spare her. She's, uh, my family comes from a, a Christian background. And so she's, she's doing these long walks along the beach and she's praying. And then she sees something floating uh, on the ocean and it, it washes ashore. And it is a glass bottle with a red cross on it. And she doesn't know what it is, but she knows that the Red Cross means that it's possibly something medical. Um, so she takes this bottle to uh, the doctor and says, what is this? And the doctor says, well, what's in here is that it could possibly save your daughter's life. So what it is, it's a bottle of IV solution. Because back in the day, IV solution didn't come in plastic bags. It came in glass bottles. So one just happened to wash ashore. So basically, they opened the bottle and they fed my sister this IV solution, just capful by capful, and she survived. So a few days later, um, the, uh, the United Nations sent a, um, a, a convoy of buses or trucks and to load everyone who had uh, swam ashore onto these trucks and uh, brought us to the refugee camp. The Malaysian authorities did not interfere with you when you... No, because I think that at that point there was nothing they could do, right? We were, we were there, we were, you know, they had taken a, a few days to, you know, uh, to find the right officials to bring us to the camp, but there, I, I don't know what they could have done. We were already on, on their land, right? And our boat was in flames <laughs> and sinking, <laughs> so. What camp did they take you to? What camp did I say? <laughs> um, okay, um, I believe they took us to a camp called Chera Ting. Um, I, don't, uh, I don't recall uh, very much about it, but what is interesting is that uh, just a few short years ago, I met a woman here in Ottawa who knew my parents and she apparently was one of the teachers at the camp. She was a volunteer teacher who would, uh, who would teach the children, uh, give them something to do. So uh, apparently she taught me. <laughs> so I, like my only memory of that camp is of, of looking for food and finding what I thought was a piece of candy, but instead it was a penny. Did your parents ever describe the conditions of that camp to you? No, they never described the conditions of the camp, but they do have pictures. So I, uh, the camp, um, you know, I mean, there was, it, was easy, it was easy to walk in and out of. I, it's like, you know, it's, it's like these simple structures with blue tarps. And I just remember one picture, I'm wearing um, what looks like pink pajamas. And so, you know, that's what I wore every day, this, this outfit that was like a pink t-shirt and pink pants with flowers on them. And it was um, um, near a populate, populated area? It was not isolated? I'm not sure. How long were you there? We were there probably about six months. Um, and I had mentioned that um, when my family fled, we had the 30 pieces of gold, we had $75 US, and we had a letter. And that letter was from my aunt in uh, Canada who was attending Bible school at, in Three Hills, Alberta. And basically all the letter said was that, um, you know, my, my dad's name is Sam, my mom's name is Rebecca, this, this is my brother Sam. He's my brother. I live in Canada. If he's brought to Canada, I can take care of him financially. That's, that was a letter. And when we jumped off the boat, everything, we lost everything. Um, nothing was salvageable. We just had the clothes that we were wearing. But that letter was tucked 
inside three shirts <laughs> that my dad had. He kept it very close to his heart. And that letter survived, and you could still see the ink on it. So when Canadian authorities showed up at the camp, that was the first thing my father showed them, was that it was this letter from my aunt saying, you know, this is Sam. Like, we had no more identity papers, no identification whatsoever, but we had that letter. Do you know anything about how your aunt ended up there first? I mentioned that uh, we came from a relatively wealthy family. Uh, my aunt had a scholarship, and uh, we, and she was, uh, she was attending a Bible college. So we had basically, my grandfather had uh, paid for her education in Canada. She was a foreign student in Canada. And what year was that that she arrived in Canada? She would have arrived in Canada probably the late 60s. And uh, so she was attending university. Um, and uh, when she arrived in Canada, um, she also met, you know, she married someone uh, who was a, uh, who was Taiwanese. And they both ended up being employed by the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So their, their job, they were working at the time, their job was to church plant for Asian communities, for the Chinese community specifically in Canada. So they were traveling uh, to small towns and starting up churches. And you had mentioned as well that your other um, other members of your extended family had also left mm -hmm. Vietnam by then. Do you have any um, any information about how they left? They paid their way. They didn't. They didn't have the struggle that we had. They flew out of Saigon, <laughs> so they left before uh, Saigon fell. So they left probably. There's a photo of me, of my grandparents, holding me as a child. Uh, I think, and there's a picture of me, I'm trying to think. I think they left shortly after I was born. So they would have left um, like in late, in early 1975. Whereas we didn't flee until three years later. Where did they go? They went to Hong Kong. So one of the things that happened was when we, um, when Canadian authorities accepted us, gave us a visa to Canada, um, one of the flights they put us on was to Hong Kong. So we had a night to spend to reunite with my grandparents. And I remember being in the Hong Kong airport and seeing my grandfather down this long hallway and running to him. So... They were in. Uh, they had. They had already been in Hong Kong for uh, several, for nearly a year at that time, and they were doing well. They settled in Hong Kong. No, they didn't end up settling because what ended up happening was, when uh, my parents were accepted into Canada, um, about uh, a year or two later, they sponsored my grandparents. So my grandparents, and then my uncle, uh, and my aunt. Um, then they came. But for all those th three or four years, they were living... They were in living in Canada. Or sorry, they Hong were living Kong. in Hong Kong waiting for our sponsorship because we wanted to be together. So we sponsored them to Lethbridge, Alberta. Okay, so go back to um, when you were at camp and your father had this letter to present to the mm -hmm. Vietnamese... Sorry, to the Canadian mm -hmm. visa officer. What um, what happened then? How long did it take for you to it, leave the camp? Well, once they once they found once the Canadian officials came and visited this UN camp, and uh, the, basically, um, from what I gathered, there were Australian officials there as well. There were Canadian officials, you know. So there are uh, quite a few countries willing to accept. Vietnamese boat people into their country, but I, uh, my parents said that they directly, when they saw, you know, the Canadian flag, the maple leaf, they wanted to speak to that Canadian visa official because of that letter from my aunt. They had a connection, so that was, that was our one piece of ID that provided us um, authentication and was basically our, our. Uh, permission slip to, to leave. Um, 
so once that happened, I think it was very quick. We, we were probably, we had probably flown out within two, three months of, uh, of Canadian officials accepting us into Canada. So your stay at the camp was how long in, in altogether? So if we had arrived, so 19, March 22nd was when we went to Malaysia and we had arrived in Canada by July that year. So it was quite, it was fast. And with a stopover in Hong Kong? Which was just overnight. Overnight. You mm -hmm. landed where in Canada? We landed in Vancouver and then we took a connecting flight to Lethbridge, Alberta because that is where my aunt uh, was supposed to be. But what is interesting about that is uh, my aunt Esther and my uncle James who were married and they were uh, they were missionaries and they had started a church in Lethbridge, Alberta after graduating from Three Hills Bible College. They had lost contact with us. So they didn't think that we would have survived. So when we get to Lethbridge, what happens is that we learn that my aunt and uncle accepted a job in Taiwan. So we had no one. So we arrived in Lethbridge and our main family connection had left the country. So we basically became, we were, you know, privately sponsored refugees and now we became government sponsored refugees. Do you know anything about that particular transition? That sounds like it would be a very problematic. Problem. I don't, I, you know what, I think it would have been problem. I think it would be problematic now. If, if that happened and your private sponsor just disappears, oops, if that happens in your, if that happens now, your private sponsor disappears. Um, here, let me take that again. So I think that if that situation were to happen now, it would be very problematic. Um, there was a possibility that we'd be deported back to uh, Vietnam. But it was a different time. It was before the internet. It was before they kept really in-depth computer files. And from my discussions with other um, immigration officials who, who worked, who are, you know, retired, but who, who worked during that time, you know, they're saying, you know, at, at that time, a lot of who they accepted was dependent on uh, it was dependent on each immigration officer's uh, personal views and perceptions, whether or not they would accept you. It wasn't, it was such a new program. So uh, I'm very thankful. I don't, like I said, I don't think we would have <laughs> been accepted if it was today. Um, I think in terms of our approval process, it has, um, it has tightened up and there are much more security measures attached to it. And so there should be. But at that time, um, those, you know, whether it's by the generosity or of, of the Canadian government or of the willingness of officials to uh, relax the rules for people who were desperate, we were able to uh, make Canada our home. So what were your first impressions of Canada? We came in the summer. So, was a, you know, so it was, uh, it wasn't a harsh climate. It was lovely, except Lethbridge was very windy. Um, uh, there's a photo of us in, in the newspaper, I believe, in the Lethbridge Herald, in which, because we were uh, the first Vietnamese boat people family to be accepted into that city, um, there's a photo of us coming off the airplane and my mother's hair is just blowing so crazy. It's just like the wind is so strong. So th that is, you know, that is a memory I have of Lethbridge. It was a really, um, I, I had great memories. It was a really lovely town. It was a welcoming town. We, um, our first friends um, were two uh, church ladies, uh, Mrs. Owen and, and Bella. And I remember they, um, for Christmas that year, they, they gave my sister and I two giant pandas. So the, pa the pandas were bigger than my sister and almost as tall as me. And um, <clears throat> you didn't have...
have your aunt around to support you as you no, settled in. No, we didn't. You had to figure everything out. We had to figure out. We had to figure some things out, but um, people really opened up their hearts and were very welcoming and helpful. I mentioned um, those two church ladies. They became a regular part of our lives. We were adopted by um, the Lethbridge Alliance Church, so they were members of this church. And they would visit us often. There were volunteers that would bring my father and mother to ESL classes. Um, there were individuals who uh, helped my uh, father uh, find work, suggested where he could work. Um, and uh, the other thing that I remember is that they, I guess the most important thing is that they became friends to my parents. They, uh, they were always willing to help. And I think that's one of the, the struggles of refugees is that you realize that you have come here and that you're lucky to be here. But at the same time, your new world is, can be overwhelming and it's difficult to ask for help because I think people sometimes expect you to feel you know, lucky that you've survived already, that they've given you so much because look, you're, you were supposed to be privately sponsored, but now you're a government refugee. So it's hard to ask for help. But these two ladies specifically and, and other volunteers were just always there, so we didn't have to ask. And uh, for that, I'm extremely grateful because they would be um, the building blocks of our life in Canada. Like they weren't your official government no. sponsor no. group of five or whatever. No, but not at all. they just took you under your wings and That's right. adopted you, as you say. It's quite remarkable. Do you have a, a story that you can share about that experience with that about that relationship? Well, I think sometimes people ask me. Um, they, you know, they they want to know. You know, when you're in Canada, was there one moment? Um, that that changed your life, you know, that you felt Canadian. And there were so many moments. I think the moment you become Canadian is the first time you meet your Canadian friend, right? So there was a, uh, a woman who lived across the street from us. She had a son who was the same age. His son's name was Barry. And Barry, his, his mother made him walk me to school every day. <laughs> So he never, he didn't want to walk with me at first because I was annoying. I was a kid and I was following him around. So he would always walk five or six steps ahead of me and I would just follow him to school. But then eventually, Barry walked beside me and he started talking to me and we became friends. So I think something like that, which is so simple, but it means a lot for a, uh, a child, uh, for someone trying to adapt to a new country is to have that first friend. Um, another story that has profound uh, consequences and really I think changed my life is um, an employment officer with my father. So my father, when he first got to Lethbridge, because he had English skills, he spoke Chinese, he spoke Vietnamese, he, uh, and he spoke like Cantonese and Mandarin. So there were several dialects that he spoke. And so he was actually looking for work as a translator. So at that time, he would translate for the court. He would translate for immigration authorities. But the work was really sporadic. You know, even though it was considered a good, uh, reputable job, a white collar job, and that he really took pride in, he would only get like maybe two, three hours a day. And it wasn't enough to support a family. So an employment officer actually said, why don't you consider getting a job as a welder, going to night school as a welder? And so I said, okay, I'll go to night school as a welder. But when he got that welding certification and he got his first job, he ended up getting a job with benefits. And that job with benefits included dental benefits. And for me, that was life changing because as a child, I never, never talked. I was very, I was, uh, people would always talk, look at me and they say, why do you look so grouchy? And it wasn't because I didn't know how to speak or I was too shy. It was because I decided not to speak in public because I was really embarrassed about my teeth. 
I had really bad teeth. I had a severe overbite. I had, um, they were all crooked. But because my dad got that welding job, he had dental benefits. I was able to get braces. And then, so I got braces. And when my braces came off, when I was um, in grade nine, I started speaking. <laughs> I started smiling and, and um, you gain confidence. And I, and I, and I, was, and I, now today I'm a broadcaster, right? I'm always in front of cameras. I do a lot of public speaking, but something like that would not have happened if my dad didn't get that first welding job and I didn't get dental benefits. So it, it's, it's simple, but profound. Do you remember how long uh, after he arrived did he get his first job as a translator? He almost immediately because he had English uh, skills and uh, yeah, there were, um, someone had recommended that he, uh, he do this work. Um, so it was probably within like three, four months that he was able to get the work. But he also worked as a, um, you know, he was a dishwasher for a while. Um, he was, uh, and so he was a dishwasher. My mom was a dishwasher, and uh, she, she was, she after she became a dishwasher, she was a waitress. So what would happen? My growing up, I didn't see my family a lot. Um, my dad would spend his day, you know, either in school, um, and then they would both work in the evenings. So what happened was I was really stressful for my parents, and that's why they wanted to sponsor my grandparents, thinking that if my grandparents were in Canada, they could at least take care of us and they could get another job, right? Because to support the family, and that was very important. So um, just my grandmother came first and she lived with us, and, and so basically my grandmother would raise us and uh, my dad would go to school during the day. My mom uh, would work during the day. And, and then at night, my mom would go to night school and then my dad would uh, work, take a night job at a restaurant. So that was basically my life until I was um, 15 years old, in which my parents would have felt financially stable enough that you know, they didn't need to work two jobs anymore. Where was, what was your mom training as? So I mentioned that my mom was an accountant and that she was also a reporter. But when she went to, uh, when we came to Canada, um, her first job was a dishwasher. And then she was a waitress. Um, after that, she got a job with a telephone company in which um, she would, on, a, on an assembly line, in which she would manufacture uh, telephones. So she basically put the um, the wires and the chips and uh, on telephones, <laughs> and she attached the the curly cue on the old phones. And when she went to night school, when she went to night school, she went into uh, she uh, brushed up on her accounting skills, and she also took a, um, a sort of like a um, an intro to computers. So after her her job at the assembly plant disappeared. Um, she ended up going into computer sales and then uh, her final job was in insurance. So she ended up uh, working as an insurance agent before she retired. She also started working right away? Almost immediately. Almost, um, she would do they were both trying to, they, they went to ESL courses, but in their off hours, they would try to balance each other off. They would always both try to squeeze in um, uh, jobs because they were trying to sponsor their parents. So you might have mentioned this. Your father spoke English? Yes. Your mother did? Not. My mother spoke not as much as my father, but my mother learned English in Canada. Uh, my dad had some English already. And he took ESL to just mm -hmm. go up uh, That's right. improve his English. How many years after you arrived were you able to uh, sponsor your grandmother over? It would have taken... Just trying to remember my photos when I first remember seeing my grandparents in the photos. Um, 
It would have probably taken about two, two, three years. And what else do they tell you about their struggles and obstacles in those first few years? They didn't. Uh, my parents didn't talk about struggles. They didn't talk about uh, what life was like. They just talked about what they wanted life to be like. Um, growing up, we were always told that this was an opportunity and that we were not to squander the opportunity and that a lot was expected of us um, because uh, we... Uh, it felt sometimes, it felt, there was pressure. Like, I have to admit that um, there was pressure because you worried that if you did not do well in school or if that you didn't, weren't able to get a good job, then this whole process, this whole struggle of coming to Canada um, was somehow uh, wasted. So we were, it was very clear um, to us that we needed to make something of ourselves and we needed to give back. Um, and I think that is something that my sister and I, um, and I have a brother now, he was born in Canada, um, and so that it is ingrained in us, this idea that, um, you know, your country has given you so much and that you need to give back. Um, so in terms of what we've done is like we've always... Um, We've always tried to, you know, uh, my, my father joined a political party. He really wanted to be in, in part of the process. He felt uh, very proud that he can vote. Um, my sister and I, um, we both sponsor Syrian refugee families. And for me, that has been a profound experience as well because I see in them, um, in the families that we sponsor, in their children, what we were like. And I, I see their fears, I see their hopes, and it is my, uh, my hope that they will have the opportunity to succeed. Um, you know, I mean, they, they, may, they may not have, you know, the, the, a great paying job later on, they, but at the same time, it's important to me that we pave the way to give them those opportunities, that, they, that that is an option for them, that they feel that that is something achievable, that Canadian dream. And I think um, that's, that's what I want for them. And that's what we had. We had people who were willing to um, open up their lives, to give of their time and of their resources to enable us this path towards success. And that's what I see my role as when I see um, these families arriving now. So looking back, what was, well, what were the obstacles and challenges that, that your parents faced? I think it's always language. It's always uh, the cultural gap. They didn't, um, they don't. They didn't experience any racism that I remember. Um, my only experience of racism was maybe when I was in grade two. I was seven years old and I was riding my bike, and I had ridden my bike onto someone's lawn, and the homeowner came out screaming at me, and he used a derogatory term, and I didn't even understand the term. Um, called me a gook. He goes, get off my property, you gook. And I was grade seven, or grade seven years old, grade two. I was, I was, I don't know what that means. And uh, it wouldn't be until, you know, a couple of years later when I watched, you know, when my father rented platoon or full metal, full metal jacket, I remember hearing those words and then, and then seeing snippets of those movies and understanding the context of you know, what, what a cruel word uh, that was. But at the time, I didn't understand it. And I, if you were to ask me if I ex ever experienced any racism, that's the only example I could give. And what helped their integration? 
I think uh, those two church ladies, Bella and Mrs. Owen, and um, other volunteers, having, uh, we were the first boat people family in Lethbridge, Alberta, but we weren't the last. And then a community grew. Um, and then there would, my parents became close with um, probably five or six other families. And it was important to be able to help each other, to be able to have that ability, you know, to, um, to share stories and, of support, but at the same time, um, being able to, you know, get, be given the chance to uh, work, you know, with the greater society. I think probably growing up in Lethbridge was probably the, the best thing that could have happened to me because if we were to be in a, a bigger center, I find that, you know, it's quite possible that we would have just um, gathered together and we would have been really, um, you know, we, we would have perhaps just stuck to, stuck to the Chinese community or the, or the Vietnamese community um, and we may not have branched out um, to, to, you know, to the broader Canadian society. But I feel that for me in Lethbridge, Alberta, because there were so few Asians, uh, most of my friends were Canadian, they were Western, and it wasn't, I, I never felt, you know, I, I never felt that I was displaced. I was always, you know, I was always part of the group. And it's 40 some years later, how do you feel about the life that you and your family have made here in Canada? I'm really proud of it. I think, um, I, I worry sometimes about some of the, the rhetoric that I see on social media, um, this, this characterization of you know, refugees as, as, as they, as opposed to you know, part of us. Um, I, for many years, I did not, uh, if you ask me, if, if you ask me, are you a refugee? I would have said no. <laughs> I'm like, no, I'm Canadian. I would have just said I'm Canadian. Um, but I think that since I moved, it was actually being here in Ottawa that forced me to confront that word. And in Ottawa, there in uh, the early 80s, there was uh, Mayor Marion Dewar had started a program called Project 4000 in which she wanted to commit to accepting 4,000 boat people to Ottawa. So people in this city are very proud of uh, the work they did in Project 4000. And that is something that I had never experienced before. So when I moved to Ottawa in 2000, I remember I was covering a, a conference, and it was an economic conference, but I was approached by a man at that conference, and the first thing that he wanted to know was, are you a Vietnamese boat person? And I was like, whoa, <laughs> that's really direct, and was, why do you want to know? Um, but people just kept on asking me this because they're really proud of this part of their local history. And then for me, um, I, just, I, I just realized that you know, being a, a refugee, that is part of who I am. It has, uh, it has given me strength, it has given me resilience, and that it's not a part of my history that I should ignore, but it's a part of my history that I should embrace. And I also realize that in terms of my personal self, confronting individuals who, who may have, you know, uh, racist or or hateful views of immigrants. It's important to me that um, they see me as a former refugee. Um, they see me my, in my family. Um, we are we are a family of boat people, really. So we are now seventy people in my extended family. Um, war has separated us. We are some were sponsored. Um, to Canada, some are sponsored to Australia, some are still in Asia, some are in the US. So we're all separated. But I can tell you within my family of 70 people, there are five doctors, uh, there are 12 teachers, 
there is, you know, a dentist, there is two pharmacists. So uh, our family is a successful refugee immigrant family, and this is our contribution. And we have given so much already, and we are still giving back. So it's important for me, to, for people to see that about us, that, you know, when you, when you talk about other people or refugees and you talk about them um, being a burden, you know, that, that we're not a burden, that we are individuals who love our new home and who are devoted uh, to giving back. Do you have any, some general thoughts about Canada's humanitarian reaction to the refugee crisis? Just... Yeah, I think I just, <laughs> I think yeah, I just, I just no, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really, I'm proud of it. But at the same time, I know that uh, uh, we could be doing more. Um, and I think one of the things, I think, you know, um, you know, as a reporter, I do a lot of stories on immigration. And one of the things that I keep on hearing is that in 2015, when, um, when uh, we first accepted 25,000 Syrian refugees, we were really moved by the story of the uh, Syrian boy uh, being washed ashore. Um, and that's what, that's that one story, you know, enabled 25,000 people, you know, change the political headwinds. But now, um, the political winds are blowing in the other direction, in which, you know, the, its attitudes towards refugees are once again hardening again. Um, so, in my mind, I, I'm all I can do is talk about my experience, share what my story has been, in hopes that other people will see what the future could hold. I think. If you just look at a refugee as someone who is a person who is a burden, then you're not seeing the full story. You're not seeing the value of that individual um, and the, I guess, I, I don't want to reduce people to a cost-benefit analysis. I think, you know, more importantly, people uh, our, you know, our diversity does make us stronger. But uh, sometimes I find people just want to hear it, you know, like, what, what is it that you can bring to this country? And I would say, you know, individuals who are fleeing, who, who are doing everything they can to survive, have a strength of character, have a attitude of determination that once they get to Canada, that doesn't, their attitude doesn't change. They're still willing to do that, and they want to succeed. But first, a door has to be opened for them. So that would be my observations. You keep answering the, the, question, the next question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'll just ask it anyway. But, um, sure. And that's the, that's the answer. Um, what can future generations of Canadians learn from your personal experience in Canada, Southeast Asia? Yeah, I, I think um, I think that, that doors need to be open uh, to people in order to strengthen your country, but to or also um, add uh, new uh, new thinking, new ways, uh, creative paths. I mean, I, if you were only, you know, we talk a lot about, um, if you are only hearing one type of opinion of, uh, of individuals who are born and from Canada, then that's not the full story, right? Um, it, we talk a lot about global perspectives. You need that. And I would just say the door um, needs to remain open because when you are shutting the door, then you are shutting the door to new ways of thinking, of new ways of creativity, um, new possibilities of a success. Well, thank you. You're welcome. That's all my questions. 
Is there anything else you have to add? No, I think that's good. <laughs> so thank you for the interview. Just to follow up on um, the whereabouts of your family, mm -hmm. how long did you stay? How long did your family stay in Lethbridge for? So my family stayed in Lethbridge until I graduated from university. Or sorry, I'll take that again. Um, my family stayed in Lethbridge until I graduated from high school and went to university. So until uh, 1992, 94, uh, they left. They moved to Calgary, and I. Uh, went to the University of Alberta and then to the University of Western Ontario. I returned to Alberta to work in Edmonton for a while and then uh, after a few years working in Edmonton and Fort McMurray, I moved to Ottawa. You worked as, as a reporter? Though? As a reporter. So my first and only job, well no, not my first job, but <laughs> my only job after uh, my journalism degree has been as a reporter, but I've also worked as a as a waitress uh, to put myself through school and a babysitter uh, as well as a hostess. <laughs> so those are in the service industry. Um, did any of your um, extended family stay in Lethbridge? No, nope. they have all now moved to Calgary or Edmonton or Vancouver. So uh, the Canadians. Um, some actually, one has actually moved to Hong Kong for work. And uh, uh, the, the remaining relatives um, are in Australia and the U.S. and Taiwan and Hong Kong. So when we get together, we, my grandfather passed away um, eight years ago. And one of, the, one of the things he made us promise, or he, he made my father promise and uh, his siblings, was that we would have a reunion every two years. So every two years we get together. So, 73 of us. <laughs> Where? It, it varies. Sometimes it's in Canada. Sometimes it's in the U.S. I uh, went to Disneyland one time. Um, we've, uh, mostly it's in Canada because most of the family is still here. Uh, but there are plans maybe to, uh, for an Asia reunion soon. And um, the relatives that you met in transit in Hong Kong, in transit mm -hmm. to Canada, they were sponsored to Canada by your parents? They were sponsored. So my, my parents sponsored the initial group, my, my, dad's, uh, my dad's parents. And uh, so and coming with my grandparents were my Uncle John and Aunt Deborah and Uncle Joe. So a family of five, they sponsored that initial family of five. And then uh, a few years later, when Uncle... John got married and Auntie Deborah got married, they sponsored other family relatives. So from there it grew. So at one time, when I was younger, in Lethbridge, there were probably about 25 Trins living in Lethbridge. Um, and then as everyone got older and went to various universities and got different jobs, whatever, we kind of dispersed. But Lethbridge was always the core group until about uh, 1994 when we started moving away. And your father, the, did he stay a welder uh, for much of his life? He stayed a welder until I was 16 or so, and then he, uh, he bought a restaurant. Uh, so he, was, uh, he ran his own Chinese restaurant for a while. And then when we moved to Calgary, um, I believe he returned uh, to work as a welder. And what did your mom work at um, for the rest of her life? Uh, she was, uh, I, I mentioned that she was a waitress. She had worked in a telephone manufacturing plant. Uh, she had done some accounting, uh, computer sales. And before she retired, she was a, in insur an insurance agent. 